Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Cell and Gene Therapy Solutions, Enabling PSC Translation Workflows. I'm Alexis Kraus of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labberts and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit www.thermofisher.com. Now, let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Tia Hexham. Field Application Scientist, Cell Therapy, Thermo Fisher Scientific. Dr. Hexham has a doctorate in cell and molecular biology from Tulane University, studied chronic variable stress and its effects on dendritic morphology and synaptic plasticity. From there, she did an NIH fellowship at UCSD looking at Alzheimer's disease and stress hormone signaling in human hippocampus and human NSCs, neural stem cells, derived from iPSCs. She spent the last five years working in cell therapy with regard to primary cells, 510K medical devices, and cell separation technologies. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Hexham, you may now begin your presentation. Thanks so much for that intro, Alexis. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us on the webinar today. <clears throat> I'd like to talk to you about enabling your PSD translational workflows. What does it take for you to take those PSC um, uh, cultures that you're working with and, and take them to clinic? So the IPSC field has come a long way. Uh, in the last 20 years, as you know, it's been a 20 year anniversary um, of when the P uh, stem cells started and IPSCs have come uh, in more recent years and it's come a long way. So as you can see on this slide, there's a multitude of clinical studies being conducted now utilizing this exciting technology. However, I want to talk to you about what some of the pain points and pitfalls are that you should be aware of when you're moving towards this goal. So today, I'll talk to you about an introduction into the cell and cell therapy and translational workflows that we have, how you can generate and expand the IPSCs, how, you should, uh, how we recommend quality testing of your IPSC bank, as well as some of the safety tests that you should be performing, uh, that we recommend performing when, when you're uh, going to the clinic. So as you, as you know, the cell and gene therapy industry has a number of challenges that we're facing. There's management of, and supply chain and logistics. How you can reproducibly um, perform your safety and control enabling commercial use rights, having redundancy in your manufacturing, and making sure that your raw materials are CGMP grade. There's clinical trial risk management. Bioprocessing, how can you make sure that what you're doing uh, in the lab at the bench now is something that can be scaled up and scaled out uh, for clinical trials, making sure that you can produce enough, um, let alone for when it's commercial, if, if it goes that way. Regulatory also has a number of compliance, documentation, and support issues that need to be evaluated and complied with. And you, you want to make sure that you have consistency in your quality and performance of the therapy that you're trying to produce. So when I talk to people about this, I like to talk about starting with the end in mind. There, there was a, an article that came out recently that evaluated a, a large number of clinical trials. It was somewhere in the range of, I think, 836. And when they were evaluating the clinical trials, they evaluated what would happen if you change one raw material in the middle of the clinical trial. What, what does that do? How does that impact? How does it impact cost? How does it impact efficiency? And what they found evaluating the clinical trials is that the median cost if you, if you change one critical raw material 
in, in the clinical trial, you can impact the cost as much as $150,000 in, in phase one and up to half a million dollars in phase two. So making sure that, you, that you're thinking about what you're gonna be doing early on and making sure that you're utilizing the materials that help with all of these industry challenges is really important. It can, it can sometimes make or break what, what the clinical trial is going to be doing. And so I, we, we wanna be a resource for you in that and help you think about these things early on so that we can help enable you to develop the, the therapies that I'm rooting for all of you guys to be developing. So with that, let's talk about some of the things that um, we can help you with at Thermo Fisher with that. So why am I a scientist from Thermo Fisher here talking to you about this translational workflow? It's because uh, at Thermo Fisher, we believe in making the world safer, cleaner, and healthier. And when it comes to cell and gene therapy, we're committed to helping you do that through our value proposition. The world really needs your guys' brilliant minds to get us to the next treatment. And we wanna be the partner to help you get there. So uh, I'd like to talk about the PSD workflow that we've been developing with our partners and talk to you how you can be thinking about that end at the beginning, middle, or end, wherever you may be in this, this workflow. So some of the ways that we can help enable you uh, is with EGMP grade products, giving you confidence in our results, helping you with that scalability that I talked to you about on the last slide, and really by becoming a trusted partner for you. So a lot of times when I'm uh, out talking to, to the scientists that we partner with, it's, it's really just about making sure that we're all growing in this quickly changing field together. Um, and so that's something that I get really excited about in my, in my job that I get to do. I get to talk to you guys about these things. Additionally, we have a very broad portfolio that we can support you with at Thermo Fisher. So let's talk about that PSD workflow. So here's an example of an integrated approach for how you might be generating your iPSD cell banks. So the first thing that you do is you usually have a, a donor and you take some sort of somatic cell from them and you'll be reprogramming them into iPSDs. So once they're reprogrammed, we, we generally talk about um, doing quality testing of the iPSDs so that you can save yourself a lot of time and energy and effort from what you're doing downstream. So I get a lot of questions when I'm in the field about, ah, Tia, this one didn't reprogram or it's differentiating spontaneously or there's different stuff going on. And a lot of the times you can alleviate a lot of the, the pain points that, that are involved with pluripotent stem cells if you do this quality testing early on and upfront. After you do the quality testing of your, your banks, you might have the release of those and you freeze them down, or you go uh, into the differentiation of your cells into what your, your final product, therapy product might be. Following the differentiation of the cells, You'll want to do QC of the final formulation and safety testing. And from there, you have your cell, cell therapy product that'll go back into the patient. So I'd like to talk to you about some of the, the, the tools that we've developed to help you with each stage of this, this workflow. So let's talk about the generation and expansion of iPSDs. So, one thing that's really important when you're doing the, the transition from what you're working on in the labs and the bench to your clinical work is to make sure that you have translatable products. So we have something called the Cytotune IPS 2.0 Sendai Reprogramming Kit. And this is really useful for doing your RUO. We utilize the Sendai virus because uh, it's transient and you can get it out of the cell after you're done reprogramming it, something that you can eliminate and it doesn't integrate. Uh, in addition, we have the CTS version, uh, which will help you take that to the clinic. And what's really exciting about this technology is that it's the first off-the-shelf reprogramming system designed for clinical and translational research. So um, I believe I'll talk to you about what is what, that, what it means to be CTS in this slide deck. And if not, it's something I'd like to really uh, talk about at the end. So let's talk about reprogramming. So the Cytotune IPS 2.1 Sendine Reprogramming Kit is designed for the translational use. So what are some of the ways that we take, took that REO product, the 2.0, and made it into 2.1? What did we change to make it safer to go to clinic? 
So first of all, we did this because we had we had some investigators that we were working with that were having a lot of great um, results with the 2.0, and they wanted to go to clinic. And so, you know, in our partnership with them, it was like, what do we need to make this safe and help you take it to clinic? And so that's how the development of this product came along. So the, one of the things that we did is we, we replaced the C-mix with the L-mix, and the L-mix is shown to have a weaker transformational activity, so that's giving it a little more safety. Additionally, we removed the BSA, um, because there's, if you have animal components such as BSA, there's a risk of viruses that we can't test for. Um, and so you eliminate uh, some of the risks associated with animal products. Additionally, the viral vectors are produced in a GMP certified facility, making sure that you have consistency of your material. So we're really proud of the fact that this is something that you can take from the RUO to the CTS version for a seamless transition to the clinic so that you can, you can be developing your process in the, in the research use only space. And then when you're ready to do these clinical studies or preclinical uh, workflows that you can transition over to the CTS product and, and know that it's gonna be consistent in the same way. So let's talk about the development of the Xenofree Media that, that is used uh, with this reprogramming kit. So as you can see on the very left-hand side, there's a number of colored um, graphs here, bumps on the graph. <laughs> Sounds so scientific, doesn't it? Okay, so as you can see, the blue one is the control uh, FBS. And so you can see the percentage of GFP transduction that was achieved with this is 92%. And when we were evaluating different xeno-free media, we wanted to make sure that we could have similar performance. There's always some sort of trade-off when you when you have animal products, um, when you get rid of them, because we know that the cells like animal products. So it's just, they live in an animal, they like animal products. However, when you're trying to get to that safety that's best for the patient, you're gonna have some sort of trade-off in the performance. But we really wanna design our products to be the best performing when it comes to those xeno free criteria for safety. So as you can see, there were, there were three media that, that were okay, and two that were really good um, performance that had similar transduction efficiencies. So then after we evaluated the transduction efficiency in the media, we looked at how the fibroblast growth rate performed. And as you can see in the middle graph there, there's a number of days in culture where the, the fibroblast growth rate is good. It's all really comparable for uh, candidates five and six. After that, we wanted to make sure that the reprogramming efficiency was comparable. So as you can see on the right-hand graph, you have the FBS in blue, candidate five and candidate six for the media conditions, and candidate five giving a better reprogramming efficiency. Um, like I said, there's always a little bit of trade-off when you go animal-free. But of those five different xeno-free fibroblast media formulations that we initially tested for, uh, we were able to pick top, the top two um, based on these growth rates and reprogramming efficiency. So uh, in addition to that, we want to talk about how that xeno-free media supports the isolation and expansion of the primary fibroblast. So a lot of you, some of you are doing it with skin. I'm talking to more and more people doing it from blood. Uh, we also will be talking about that in, uh, later in the slide deck. But you know, generally, you take a skin punch biopsy from a, from a patient or a donor and you have the six well coated plate with collagen. We had two to three pieces in one millimolar each well per well. And we cultured those for 10 to 14 days in the xeno free media. Um, so after the culturing, what we wanted to do was see how, what was the reprogramming efficiency and were they normal stereotypically. So uh, the xeno free candidate media five was successful to derive fibroblasts from the human skin and the resulting fibroblasts were found to be karyotypically normal. You can see the G banding here on the bottom right, right corner showing that it's a normal uh, result. So that's really great. That speaks really well to the product that, that um, safety. So just to remind you where, where we are in the workflow. So we've just discussed the reprogramming going into IPSC. So let's talk more about uh, what some of the supporting materials are that you can utilize when you're doing the xeno-free reprogramming. 
So if you're using Xeno-free reprogramming, you want to make sure that you're doing it in a Xeno-free entire workflow. It doesn't really matter if you eliminate one if you, if you don't eliminate it down the line. So we have an entire Xeno-free workflow for you that helps support that. So the GIBCO, um, so we had the fibroblasts that were reprogrammed with the CTS 2.1 kit using Xeno-free conditions. And at day seven, they were harvested with our CTS triple E. So this, this select enzyme is uh, one of our CTS products and it helps you um, to disassociate the cells and replace them. So then we replated them on laminin 521 and we have CTS products for this as well. The following day, the media was changed to either essential eight or CTS essential eight uh, media and the sequential media changes were carried out until day 18. Now after 18 days, we evaluated the transduction reprogramming efficiency and measured it with alkaline phosphatase. So as you can see in this, this data graph here, the essential eight medium, which is our research use only product, is really compatible and giving great results compared to the CTS E8 medium. So the CTS E8 medium, which is what we recommend for your translational workflow, performs just as good, if not better, as the essential eight. So there's another uh, form of us helping you go from research use only to the CTS uh, cell therapy grade uh, product that will help you with that translational workflow. So you can feel confident in the results you're deriving at the bench now, making sure that you get it to where it needs to be and is translatable down the line. So what about, what if I want to do something besides fibroblastia? You know, uh, so I'm getting, there are articles that say that fibroblasts since they're skin cells, they're exposed to sun, they're exposed to more mutations um, potential. And so we have investigators who are utilizing other cell types. And what's really exciting about this, this uh, reprogramming kit is that it supports reprogramming of other cell types too. And so uh, in addition to doing the fibroblast reprogramming, uh, the scientists in our lab also did reprogramming with CD34 positive cells, with hem hematopoietic stem cells, and with T cells. And so as you can see here with the 2.1 and the 2.0 kit, you, you have good reprogramming efficiency uh, that works among all of the cell types. There's always that little, little uh, trade-off when you're doing the translational work to go to the safer version, but I'm really quite happy uh, with, with the, the ability to show that you can, you can utilize this in a lot of cell types and it's, it's exciting. So in addition to that, we wanted to evaluate if you're going to do this, the T cell reprogramming, we know that you have to have um, antibody or anti-CD3 uh, coated plates, or we wanted to make sure that you could utilize our entire workflow. So we have CTS, CD3, CD28, which are uh, known to be used in commercial cell therapy products. And we wanted to make sure that that worked seamlessly in the workflow as well. So we compared using those uh, CD3, uh, CD28 beads uh, with the traditional version of having the CD3 antibody coding. Sometimes the antibodies um, aren't cell, cell and gene therapy grade material. So for your regulatory reasons, you want to try and maintain using products that are, that are easier for you when you're filing the IND, when you're trying to transition to the clinical workflow. And so, um, as you can see in this left-hand graph, the CD3, CD28 beads performed just as well uh, as the consistent, as the classical CD3 antibody coding. We also wanted to arm you with the information about utilizing different uh, matrices for growing your cells. So uh, we have a recombinant uh, laminin 521, and we also have vitronectin as part of our cell therapy. Um, systems, products that we can offer you when you're translating to the clinic to file your IND. And as you can see, the laminin 521 has a slightly better reprogramming efficiency than vitronectin, but, I, but they both work very well. And um, depending on your, what you're doing down the line and how your cells are and the investigators, some of my investigators love the vitronectin more than the recombinant 521, but regardless, you have the options when you're utilizing the CTS products from, from Thermo Fisher Scientific. So another question that I get a lot when I'm, when I'm working with customers, I mean with scientists in the field, 
is, uh, do you have, like, how can you support me with the entire Xeno free workflow? And so one thing that I really love is the scientists um, in R&D have prepared, prepared protocols for you to help you with the entirely compliant Xeno free workflow. So we, we can provide that to you in a, in, in a follow-up if you'd like. And we have the fibroblast, the CD34, and the T cells. So, um, and we want you to know that we have this available for you so that you don't have to go and troubleshoot and develop this on your own. Uh, it's something that we can, we can help support you with. So depending on if you're using T cells, then we have a different media we recommend, such as the optimizer. We also have CTS grade cytokines that we can help perform, um, provide you with. Um, yeah, and then we even provide recipes for the fibroblast medium if you're util utilizing fibroblast. And that's provided in the CTS Cytotune kit. So I'm talking to you about safety a lot in this webinar, but you know, if you're using something like a virus, I'm telling you, free, you should go without a virus uh, or without animal products because they could have a viral, viral um, risk. However, I'm utilizing a virus to reprogram. So how can we make sure that there's clearance of that, that viral, um, the Sendai virus? So one thing that we're able to do, which is really nice, is we can show you uh, that there is clearance of the Sendai virus. So I told you it's a transient virus, and uh, so then don't just believe me, prove it, right? So here's the data to prove it. The rate of the Sendai virus solution was uh, typically between five to eight passages, um, and then this is from our fibroblast donors that were following throughout this entire workflow. So of all of the clones, there, there was the Sendai virus was undetectable by passage eight. So that's, that's really great to see that, you know, it only takes eight passages before the Sendai virus has clearance, complete clearance from your cells. However, a lot of times uh, customers will come to us asking, how can I prove this to my regulatory body? So if you would like further, um, further confirmation that the Sendai virus was cleared from your, from your, your cultures, uh, we provide a custom TACMAN Sendai quantification assay. And this can be used to further determine the exact confi number of Sendai virus um, and its backbone and monitor its dilution throughout each passage. So as you can see, um, we have the, the Sendai virus reference material on the left. We provide to you the PC, PCR kit, and then you do the amplification to show um, how it's how it's programming out. And in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, we show PBMCs that we reprogrammed and how, how, how fast they dilute out, as well as the positive control. So this is a really nice uh, additional, additional supporting uh, product that can help you show that your reprogramming uh, worked, but that also you've gotten rid of the virus that you used to reprogram it. Sorry, excuse me, it's not that it worked, it's just that you got rid of the virus. So you'll, we'll show you how to test how it worked in these following slides. So once you've reprogrammed the cells, how can you do the quality testing of the resulting ITSC banks? So uh, I've been showing you the workflow where you isolate, reprogram, bank and recover, and now we're at this place where we do expansion and gene editing. But before you do that, you wanna make sure before you spend the copious amount of time that we all know it can take when we're working with PSDs. You wanna make sure that you're not gonna waste months differentiating, testing, developing cells that might not be uh, appropriate. So this is the number one, number one way that I see as uh, a potential for how you can save time, money, and, and headache. <laughs> so let's talk about the ways that you can confirm pluripotency and make sure that you have the ability to differentiate as well as karyotyping. So uh, traditionally in the PSC space, uh, you have qualitative antibody methods that we utilize to show that they're undifferentiated and that um, they can be differentiated. However, I get, a, I get a lot of scientists telling me it takes a long time, it's painful. I also have some people that don't really trust the antibody because uh, you know, sometimes autofluorescence, stuff like this. So th there's a lot of need for making sure that there's an actual quantitative way um, to, to show that, that you have the potential to 
that A, they're undifferentiated PSDs, and B, that they have the ability to differentiate. Um, in addition to this, there's no reference standards. So this makes it really difficult to compare between lots of antibodies or uh, what have you, as well as between labs. So another thing that's really important as you, as you progress in this translational um, uh, path, you want to make sure so sometimes you might be having your manufacturing facilities have multiple sites. So uh, you might be, you know, manufacturing in the U.S. and you might be manufacturing in Germany and you might be manufacturing in Japan. So you want to have the ability to consistently compare between labs and manufacturing sites to make sure that um, you have consistent reprogramming and differentiation. So let's talk about how we can help you with that. So the latest comprehensive methods A, are standardizable and scalable. So uh, we have three, three tests that we recommend for your quality tests of your PSCs. So the PLURA test is a high density gene expression assay that assesses pluripotency and the presence of stem cell markers. So this one's uh, really nice um, because you can, well, I'll talk about it in some of the following slides, but it's nice because you can compare uh, and it has a lot of reference uh, material so that there's a lot of um, ability to compare and standardize between all of the people who are running this test. The scorecard is a high density gene expression array run on a chip. We have scorecard gene expression assay, uh, lower density TACMAN assay, in addition to evaluating self renewal. You're also evaluating the differentiation potential. And then finally, for genomic stability, we have digital karyotyping and genotyping in a single assay. And we provide that in two different forms. We have karyostat and karyostat HD. So let's talk about those a little bit more in depth. So, the pluritest tool is a computational model of pluripotency based on transcriptome analysis. We, this was developed by Franz Josef Mueller and Jean, Jean, Jean Loring at Scripps. Um, and so this is an example, I was also talking to you about partnering with, with, our, with, our, uh, with our partners. So this is a great example of partnership and how we want to be partnering with you as you develop um, ways to help advance this field, we want to help uh, make that available to, to everyone. So this is a very widely published and comprehensive reference set that you can benchmark your samples to. So you don't need bioinformatics, which makes it very user-friendly, and um, the, the Pluritest software performs the analysis for you. So um, if, you, if you want to see more about this, there's always, there's a number of, <laughs> excuse me, uh, so the reference set has 450 samples, 264 of them are human embryonic stem cells and iPSD lines. Uh, it's a well-published method, as I said, but we also have a link um, on our website where you can see the most up-to-date um, publications that are utilizing this. So what's really great about it is the more, the more people that use it, the more, uh, the more comparison we have about what's going on in the field. So let's look at what the uh, analysis data might look like when you're, when you're running this pluripotency test. So as you remember at the beginning of the talk, we did the fibroblast uh, reprogramming and we, we derived three clones from the parental fibroblast. So uh, that parental fibroblast is in the bottom right hand corner in blue. And that shows a high novelty score as well as a very low pluripotency score. So as you can see, the pluripotency is on the, the, the left-hand side, and the novelty is on the bottom. And our IPSC clones that we reprogram and derived are high on the pluripotency score and low on the novelty score. So what this means is that they have high pluripotency and low novelty, which means they're, they're not being differentiated. Uh, they're not differentiated. So uh, this this is a really nice way to show that your clones are pluripotent. So what are some other ways that we can help with making sure that you have the differentiation potential? So I, I, I get a lot of questions around this. Um, it's, it's something that's painful. So um, if you're not doing these quality tests up front to show that you have the, the reprogramming 
uh, and it's done in a proper way, sometimes we just start differentiating right away. Oh, look, I got the stem cell. It looks nice. The morphology is beautiful. But then when we go to, to work with the cells and differentiate them, sometimes there's problems like, oh, well, this one only goes to hindbrain and this one goes to this one. So, I, you know, there's a lot of discussion about this when I'm talking to scientists and working with scientists on this. And one of the ways that you can help make sure that you're setting yourself up for success <clears throat> is to make sure that the stem cells that you're utilizing out front have the ability to differentiate into all three germ layers. So the scorecard panel is a Tacman HPS uh, human pluripotency panel um, to evaluate that differentiation potential. So this was developed with as Alex Meisner of Harvard and it's composed of 93 genes with a cloud-based software. It's a published method um, that has good adoption and we have generated it using our CTS workflow. Uh, once we generated the, clo the clones in the CTS workflow, the scorecard assay, we analyzed the clones. So I'm gonna show you that on the next page. But here you can see the publication and the specific genes by category, as well as the reference set for what it was compared against. So the scorecard confirms trilineage differentiation potential. And, and let's look at what that data looks like when, it, when, when you get it from the, from the scorecard itself. So you have the undifferentiated cells here. Um, and then that's what we're measuring. So the three clones that we've been tracking throughout this, this uh, talk have been measured with the scorecard. Now, uh, the green bar is a bar that shows the self-renewal markers. And then the box plots, these are reference sets um, of undifferentiated cells. <clears throat> so the self-renewal in green shows that it has high self-renewal markers. And then the blue, orange, and dark blue are the three different germ layers. So you have the mesoderm, endoderm, and ectoderm. And it's showing that it's negative for those at this time because these are undifferentiated cells. However, as you differentiate, then you can uh, show the that, that they're able to differentiate into the three germ layers. So um, as you differentiate, that green box will go down and the trilineage differentiation potentials of these clones will go the opposite way. So that's a really helpful tool for, for helping assess that you have the differentiation potential that you need so that you don't waste countless days, weeks, months uh, trying to differentiate if this, the cells that you were starting with don't have the ability to differentiate. But, you know, don't just take my word for it. We, this has been a, this has had a number of publications that have utilized these tools, and it's something that's really exciting to see. Um, so a recent stem cell report was talking about using, excuse me, utilizing the scorecard and pluritest tool. In this, in this uh, paper, they utilized that they assessed the pluripotency at a functional level and distinguished normal HPSCs from cells with a differentiation defect. Um, so that's how they, they utilized scorecard. For the pluritest, they commented that there's a lack of standardization in pluripotency assessment because markers are demonstrated at mRNA or protein levels and methods vary between qualitative immunofluorescence staining or quantitative SACs and qPCR. So in this respect, pluritest is a significant advance because it advances the global gene expression of a query sample and provides a quantitative result. So these authors, um, third, third party unbiased authors, uh, propose that pluritest in combination with the HPSC scorecard um, is a good way for routine characterization of human pluripotent stem cells. And like I mentioned when we were talking earlier, I, you know, I really appreciate something that's standardized where I can compare between labs or uh, you know that the colleagues that you're, you can even do it, you can compare against your competitors who you're competing against for the next article, right? But you want to make sure that you have that standardization in the field and these are tools that are really, um, really great to make sure that you can, you have that, that reference set and that we're all evaluating in the same way to help advance the field instead of all of this <laughs> the typical talk that we have where it's, well, you know, if you do something, if you hop on your left foot and rub your nose <laughs> just right, the stem cells will grow. 
So uh, there's a, you know, to eliminate some of that superstition or experience base and try to make it more standardized so that we can have consistent cell therapy products uh, as we advance the, the PSD field towards uh, being able to produce cell therapy, cell therapy treatments. So let's, let's remind ourselves where we are in the workflow. So we've just discussed two of the quality testing for IPSD banks. So we talked about the Pluritest and the TACMAN. I'd like to talk to you next about genomic stability in your PSD cultures and why that's important. And then after that, we'll talk about some of the safety measures that we have to um, evaluate when we're going to the clinic and putting these back in the patient. So there's a, there's a big importance in uh, assessing the genomic stability um, of pluripotent stem cells. So based on the literature, um, about 20% of PSCs are known to accumulate chromosomal abnormalities, in particular chromosomal gains. Um, there's other variants such as subchromosomal CNBs and SNBs that are less prevalent in IPSCs. But as you can see, there's a couple of papers referenced here. And you know, the most common chromosomal aberration are, are gains or um, uh, deletion. So the frequency of aberrations in human ESCs is 32 to 34 percent and 20 percent in the induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, and so this really speaks to the fact that there's a, there's a really large need to make sure that you have genomic stability, that the reprogramming didn't pr produce some sort of aberration that's, that's dangerous, A, that's not going to get you the results you need, and that's dangerous for the patient or, or a potential treatment model that you're working with. So we have two, two ways to help you with this. We have the karyostat and the karyostat HD assays. So this is a test that uh, is based on a large number of probes. So we have um, a, uh, in silico reference uh, based on 300 normal individuals and cell lines. And then we've designed a number of probes to, for these assays. So the karyostat uh, has around 350 15,000 probes, while the Karyostat HD has 2.6 million probes in their assay. Um, this is sensitive for detection of mosaicism, and it's independent of con uh, confirmation of copy state number, which helps you to get an accurate breakpoint determination. So as you can see in the bottom left, we recommend the Karyostat for research use, and then we recommend the Karyostat HD for when you're going to your translational workflow, because it gives you a really a much higher resolution. Um, and uh, as you can see, there's a, the ability to detect gains. If you use the HD, it's 25 to 50 KB. Uh, so you have really nice uh, resolution here. They are able to detect SNP um, SNPs, and it has a broad coverage and high resolution. So uh, this is a really nice uh, tool for evaluating the genomic stability. So one thing that I get a lot of questions about in the field is what can karyostat do or not do? Because the traditional way that people have been evaluating this in their pluripotent stem cells is G-banding. But we know there's a number of pain points with that, uh, associated with that. So sometimes there's a large backlog of cytogeneticists able to process it. You have to keep your cells um, alive when you're shipping it. Uh, whereas with our karyostat, you can spin them down into a pellet and ship them to us. <clears throat> uh, however, let's be clear about the, the difference in doing a, a G-banding versus a molecular-based probe. So karyostat versus G-banding, we, we can definitely do CNV gain or loss. Um, we have the increased ability to show SNP uh, changes, which uh, G-banding doesn't have the resolution to do. Uh, we can both do aneuploidy. Uh, the karyostat can also do CNLOH and LOH changes, as well as mosaicism. So since it's a molecular-based assay, one thing that I want to make sure that you're aware of is that it, it can't show, it'll show if the genes are present, but it can't show if the genes have moved. So any of the, the features that you might look for where you have movement of a gene from one chromosome to another, such as inversion, translocation, or SNV, will not be able to be detected with this. However, sometimes with G-banding, um, you know, you might not have the resolution to show that either. It just depends. 
what another thing that's important to consider that if you do have a translocation, which you would be able to detect with uh, G banding, there's usually a large number of deletions or uh, there's usually deletions that go along with that. And you won't be able to detect those specific gene deletions unless you use a molecular-based assay like karyostat. So it's really good to, to, it's, to, to utilize this molecular-based assay uh, in, in addition to uh, some of the, the methods that have been used previously, such as T-banding. So at the beginning of this talk, we started talking about reprogramming and following our cell lines throughout this, uh, this workflow, excuse me. And so I want to show you that uh, the karyostat, uh, what it looks like when you do the readout of the molecular-based assay. And then I want to show you the clones that we derived with our reprogramming kit and all of our xeno-free workflows and what they look like. So one thing that's really great, so sometimes molecular-based assays, I don't know about the audience, but for me, I found them sometimes to be painful depending on how the data comes to you. And so one thing that I really love about how they've developed the software for this karyostat assay is they show you um, the molecular information in a format that you're used to, to seeing in the past. So as you can see on the left, you have the karyostat assay, and on the right, you have the G-banding. And so you can see that, that they've designed the, the software tool to show you the information uh, in a visually friendly format. And so it's really exciting. So on the top, we have the normal H9 ESC, normal female, and that's compared to the G banding. And then to show you that we can detect the abnormal, uh, we also have the abnormal male below. And so as you can see, when there's extra chromosomes on the G banding on the right, it'll show up as two bars on our software. Excuse me. So let's look at some of the reprogramming that we did for this, uh, this workflow. So the IPSC clones that we utilized with our, um, our entire workflow uh, and reprogramming kit come out to be normal. So we have the parental fibroblasts on the top left, and then we have the, uh, the normal clones that came from that uh, same, same parental fibroblast. So as you can see on the right, when you line up, the, the, they're color-coded now, when you line it up that they're all normal, due to the absence of blue or red triangles. So if you do have an abnormality, uh, there will be a red or a blue triangle that'll draw your eye to it. And then you'll click here. I'll show you what it looks like in the next slide. So what does it look like if you have an abnormality? So further analysis of the PSCs. Um, we, so we did a further analysis. I, sh I just showed you the karyostat research use uh, with the 315,000 probes. Now I want to show you the karyostat HD, uh, which is something that we recommend you consider and utilize for your translational use. So at the top, we have the karyostat, uh, which shows no chromosomal abnormalities at the lower resolution, which is about two uh, MB gain, gains or loss. So then if you look at the karyostat HD, you see there's a little red triangle. It may or may not be hard for you to see, but we've, we've circled it in red. And when, what's really cool about this software is it shows you visually like, oh, here's something you need to look at, and then you'll click at it, and at the bottom of the screen, there'll be something that opens up, and it'll show you uh, exactly what, what is missing or gained at that, that site. So although detected there was a loss of, at the short arm of chromosome 7, it didn't contain any genes. And so uh, that shows that it's still safe to proceed forward so that you've done the high resolution. Uh, you have a loss here in the high resolution, but there is no genes that you actually lost. So that gives you great reassurance uh, when, you're, when you're thinking about taking these, these cells and putting them back into a patient for the treatment. We, so I've talked to you about reprogramming, some of the, given you some, some information about xeno-free workflows that we can help support you with. And we've talked about uh, doing the, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> the QC analysis of your PSCs um, through into differentiation. However, once you differentiate into whatever it is that you're, that you're looking at, what are some safety assays that you might want to consider before putting it back into the patient? And so these will be questions that you should consider up front before you go in your preclinical clinical work. Um, and, and we, we have some things to help support you with that. So there's been recent concern 
of PSCs harboring P53 mutation and that posing a safety risk. So a substantial fraction of PSCs, around 6%, harbor P53 mutations. There's 15 instances of P53 mutations that have been observed when a researcher with H9 ESCs from different labs. So the same cell line in four different labs harbored these uh, mutations. And so careful genetic characterization of your pluripotent stem cells should be carried out before clinical use. And one of the ways that we can help support you with this is we have an oncomine assay. Uh, this, um, there's multiple biomarker and next generation sequencing. This assay has been adopted by leading cancer institutions around the world and is used to profile thousands of samples in different translational and clinical research products, including, including the NCI MATCH trial. Uh, this delivers consistent and reliable results. So as you can see here, um, we have a number of hotspot genes, full length genes, copy number genes, and gene fusions that are evaluated in this, this oncomine assay. <laughs> so this is something that a lot of, uh, we get a lot of questions about for the P53 mutation risk, and we do have something um, to help you with that evaluation when you're ready for that step. So we, we wanted to utilize this and show that the, the cells that we reprogrammed, they, they don't have the, the hotspot variants. So the number of variants between the parental fibroblasts and PSC clones were comparable. So as you can see on the left, we have the, the, the first line is the parental fibroblast used in the, the workflow here, as well as a number of subclones that we derived from that. We also have the H9 ESC line, um, BG01V ESC line, and then some positive control, a positive control. So although some splice variants were observed, none of them harbored any cancer hotspot variants. So the P53 variant remains same across parental and iPSCs. All iPSCs derived from the CTS Cytotune iPSC kit 2.1 lack the hotspot variants and are hence safe. So this assay helped us detect any risk of introducing cancer back into the patient. So the last thing you wanna do when you're treating a disease is introduce another disease or another risk. So this is a really great way to help you make sure that you're not going to introduce that into the patient. Another key safety measure is making sure that the iPSC clones that you derive are actually from the same fibroblast parental um, cells that you took from the patient. So there have been a number of, of papers that have shown that uh, cell lines have been misclassified or misidentified and that they can be mixed up. So in order to have another safety measure, and this will be something that will be important as you move into GMP, uh, is to make sure that, you know, what you took from the patient, what you grew in the lab, and what you put back in the patient are from the same patient. So it's not very practical to just have one patient in the lab. So we know that there's going to be some risk. And so what can we do to help you with that? And we have uh, something called the Identifiler Direct Kit. And this helps you do fragment, fragment analysis and map the software to show that these are the, the same cells that you took from the patient before. So um, in, in this example, we use the uh, Authentifiler PCR Amplification Kit. Uh, to confirm that the iPSC clones match with the parental fibroblast. So at the top, we have just a research use only GIBCO uh, PSC. So we, we help support labs by providing pluripotent stem cells um, for some other research use as a positive control. We also have the H9 iPSCs uh, that are available, and we've compared those. And then we took the fibroblast with two of our clones and showed that uh, those are indeed from the same fibroblast donor. <clears throat> so as you can see on the right, obviously our, our two controls did not match, thankfully, and did not have any contamination in our clone. And then we show that our fibroblasts and our, our clones are from the same individual. So this assay using the Applied Biosystems Identifiler PCR amplifi Amplification Kit it's critical to determine that cell identity and distinguish it from other products being manufactured in the same facility. This helps you ensure there's no cell line mix-up or contamination when you're looking at, when you're making these PSC clones. So here's the, here's the part that's really important for you 
<clears throat> that I've been hinting at throughout the entire presentation. Let's, let's talk about the cell therapy system and, um, and what that means. So Gibco CTS means cell therapy systems product provide you with a proven choice uh, so you can transition your cell therapy uh, work. So we have 20 years of GMP manufacturing of cell therapy products, and we also have extensive documentation to help support you. So if you buy a CTS branded product, what does that mean for you? First of all, it's manufactured in a CGMP compliant manufacturing facility. And what's really gonna be important for you as you're thinking towards cell therapy and treatment of patients in clinical trials is to make sure that the, the reagents and the raw ancillary materials that you're utilizing are, are compliant with the 21 CFR Part 820. So these are manufactured in CGMP, uh, that's for medical devices, our facility has utilized for medical device manufacturing. Um, and it's compliant for the 21 CFR Part 820. So this FDA registered manufacturing site we also have ISO 13485 certified quality systems and uh, the ability to support you with all the documentation you need. So what does it mean to have that 21 CFR part 820? So first of all, the cell therapy systems, they're registered so that you can use them in cell and gene therapy manufacturing. What that comes with as support for you as you're working on your preclinical work to file your IND as we give you traceability documentation, including drug master files. So we have already sent an, a lot of information to the FDA for you so that when it goes, when it's time for you to file, you just say reference this drug master file and that eliminates the need for you to do extra paperwork. So we're helping you with the paperwork uh, when it comes to filing with the FDA. It also means that there's extensive safety testing. So this includes sterility, endotoxin, adventitious agents, and mycoplasma on applicable products. So th that just means we've, we're giving you the safest, best reagents and ancillary materials to help you with your cell therapy use. In addition to that, our CTS products have been used in a number of uh, commercial products out on the market. So they're used in FDA-approved CAR T cell therapies. And they've also been used in the first FDA-approved therapeutic cancer vaccine. Additionally, we're the, our products are used in over 100 clinical trials. So that gives you that reassurance and confidence that when you're using one of our cell therapy systems, CTS-branded products, that it really means that you're working with something that's safe and that you can rely on when you're, when you're going to work with patients and go to the clinic. We have some references on this page, too, of some of those some of those things that I've been talking about as far as the FDA approved CAR T cell therapies with some press releases about, about that. Um, and then, so I talked to you about, I've talked to you about reprogramming. I've hinted a little bit at the media system. So we have a really nice webinar that Joanna uh, gave a couple of weeks ago, which I recommend you listening to, where she really does a, a deep dive into this uh, CTS Essential 8 and the Essential 8 products that you can utilize for this. Um, it's, a, it's a really cool webinar as well. So we've talked about the media, we talked about the quality testing that you need, and we've talked about some of the safety tests that we recommend. But do, you, do we have all of the CTS products compatible for the entire workflow? And my answer is we have a number of CTS uh, products that are compatible, that are uh, compatible with CTS Essential 8, as well as you, the entire workflow. So we have uh, CTS Knockout Serum Replacement XF, which is good for helping you with your fibroblast culture. We have the reprogramming kit, which I talked to you about. We have the growth matrices that I also talked about. We have Versine and CTS Triple LE Select and Revitacell. So Revitacell is a good product for when you're thawing your cells after banking them. That really helps you get the, um, the recovery that you'd like to see. Uh, and then banking and recovery, we have a number of products too. We have the Synthafreeze, we have Cryopreservation Kit, and like I was mentioning, the Revital Cell Supplement. In addition to these workflow products that we can help you with in your entire workflow, we also have the characterization tools that I've talked to you about. So we have those cellular-based methods that I talked about with the CSC Live Staining Kit. We have the Immunocytochemistry Kits and the Three Germ Layer Immunocytochemistry Kit. But as I talked to you about in this entire slide, and I hope I've conveyed to you the importance of is looking at the characterization at the molecular level. 
you want to be sure that you're saving yourself time and energy and making sure that you're producing the products that are safe. So the ones that we talked about here were the Pac-Man HPSC scorecard, uh, the, the Pluritest, the PrimeView gene expression assay, and the karyostat assays. So we're able to support you throughout that entire workflow with CTS products. So that really helps you. So make sure that you, you talk with us or, um, or, or the other Thermo Fisher colleagues about making sure that you have stuff when you're using the research use only, making sure that you have something that's compatible for when it's time to move to these cell therapy system products for your translational work. Uh, a good time to be doing that is early in your process development, um, but for sure, preclinical uh, stages are a good time to do that translational work to switch over to that CTS product because that helps save you that time and money and efficiency that we talked about. You're going to be evaluating with the products that you'll utilize all the way through, um, and that'll be really beneficial in saving you all that a, a lot of time and effort and money. So uh, I hope that we've been able to have some sort of learning on what we can do and help you with in your integrated approach for the generation of high quality IPSC cell banks when it comes to translational use. Um, I talked to you about the generation and expansion of IPSCs, quality testing of the IPSC banks, and the safety testing that, you that we recommend performing before putting these cells back into the patient for the cell therapy that you've developed. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna really thank all the researchers and people that are listening in the audience today for your work. We're very passionate about bringing cell therapy, cell and gene therapy forward, and I'm excited to work with you guys every day. It's a really cool field. And uh, so, so thanks for paying attention to the things that you need to to help these, these treatments get to the clinic faster. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and open it up for questions. Thank you, Dr. Hexum, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the answer question box located on the far left of your screen. It will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Dr. Hexum, our first question is, karyostat versus karyostat HD, when do I use which one? That's a great question. Um, so I think, I, you know, I touched on it a little bit. Um, so for the, the low resolution and high resolution assays, it's a matter of what level of safety are you looking for? Are you just doing a quick test before you develop your process further for differentiation? Then we recommend using the low, the low resolution kit. However, if you're to the stage where you're doing this clinical work and taking uh, samples from patients that might be utilized or banked for potential therapies in the future, we highly recommend using the HD um, <clears throat> so that you can detect both the CMV and the SMP and so you have real confidence in the insertion or deletion. I also get some researchers who are interested in um, genetically manipulating, doing gene editing of their PSC clones. And sometimes they want to they want to just do one SMP um, deletion or addition. And so this th th it's also appropriate at that time if you do that gene editing to use uh, the resolution that you need for how how big or little your, your gene editing can be. So it really depends on your workflow, but overall the, the general, if you're doing research use only, use the karyostat. If you're going to clinic and having real patients and you wanna make sure it's safe to go back into the patients, we recommend that you evaluate and utilize the karyostat HD. But like I said, if you're doing genome editing and you need that higher resolution, it might also be useful for that. Uh, we do also provide the karyostat serve service for you um, if you don't want to do this in-house, so it's something that you can utilize um, and send to us to, to perform for you as well. That's a good question. Now let's move on to our next question. I've already derived my cells in Essential 8. Now can I transfer them to CTS Essential 8? Yes, for sure. So uh, we have a, a, a protocol and suggestion for how to adapt that. It's, it's fairly easy. Um, I, I did mention Joanna's webinar, which I recommend you listen to and click on, or else we have provided on the website um, a really seamless workflow for, for um, trans transitioning your cells from E8 to CTS E8. So really that CTS E8, what we did is we made sure that we had 
we've done all the paperwork and documentation and that we have good uh, good raw materials for that cell and gene therapy. Um, so there isn't going to be a lot of a lot of um, difference, but it's always good to do that that transfer and that adaptation for you. And so I recommend utilizing those those tools that we have available for you if you have have that um, your cells already in the E8. We are getting so many great questions in, but we do only have time for a couple more. So let's keep going. Now, why would I want to use both, uh, excuse me, PLIRA test and scorecard? That's a great question. So uh, there, you know, we get this question only because of the PLIRA potency, but as I hoped that I was able to show you, um, they're complementary. So the PLIRA test is really great when it comes to standardization, making sure that you're comparable, you have reference sets, and that you're doing comparable work among the lab, all the labs in the world, right? So that's really great for making sure you have the pluripotency and, and having comparability and standardization in the field. Now the scorecard um, is also great because that shows you the differentiation potential. So, you know, that, uh, that paper that I showed you, um, they're, they're quite complementary. And so making sure that you can differentiate into the three germ layers, it's also very important because if you have that differentiation defect, you're gonna have a lot of problems deriving the cells that you want down the line. So they're, they're complementary and something that we recommend utilizing together. And, you know, hopefully you don't just take my word for it. You utilize that publication and read over that publication that I showed you in this webinar today to help you make that decision for yourself. And Dr. Hexham, it looks like we have time for one more question. Can you identify translocation with karyostat? Oh, I love that question. So I did talk about it a little bit, right? Um, we talked about it in the in the in the talk a little bit, but so I've I've had some some researchers think that this replaces G banding completely. And like we discussed a little bit, when it comes to a molecular based assay, I can tell you if the gene is there or not there, or uh, the, whatever it is that the probe that you're detecting. But I cannot tell you if it's moved. So translocation cannot be assessed. However, you know. As, as we continue in this world, the number of places that can perform G-banding, there's a large backlog. There's a lot of pain points that we have for that um, in the field. Uh, so we recommend that you use the karyostat. And then the next best thing is to try NGS. But a lot of people can't afford NGS. Um, and so this is a really good uh, in-between product for helping you with that. So no, it cannot detect translocation based on the on the the, the type of assay it is. It's a molecular assay, so it cannot show that. However, um, sometimes, uh, like I mentioned, with those with those translocations, you might have deletions in the in the genes, and so you want to you want to utilize something like karyostat. So, a you might use G banding to show that you don't have translocations early on, and then b what you would do to be complementary is to if you do find a translocation and you feel comfortable that it doesn't have a functional risk, you might want to an analyze the, the genes that are being deleted in addition to it. So they're, they're, they don't, one doesn't necessarily replace the other, but one has a less of a pain point for you and an ability to show a, a deeper resolution. So no, it cannot t detect translocation, but it can help you uh, look at the deletion of the genes around that translocation that usually occur and get a lot uh, better resolution into what, what's happening at the molecular level. Thank you, Dr. Hexum. Do you have any final comments for our audience? No, I just, I just really appreciate the fact that I was able to give this webinar today. Um, I love uh, talking to the scientists that are working in this field. It's, it's so exciting. It's, it's really personal to me and all of my colleagues at, at Thermo Fisher to help you guys make the world cleaner, healthier, and safer, healthier in this regard. Um, you know, as a, as a previous neuroscientist and somebody who works in the cell therapy field, I, I love seeing what's coming out. And I really just encourage you to interact with us and develop the relationship so that we can continue to have these important and interesting conversations about moving the field forward. Thank you so much for the work that you guys are doing, those of you who are listening. Um, and we look forward to working with you in the future. So thanks a lot.
Thank you again, Dr. Hexum, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank Labberts and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we didn't have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand through June of 2019. Labberts will alert you via email when it's available for replay, and we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, Goodbye.